Welcome back. Of course, life as we know it has radically changed over the past few weeks. Talk about an understatement. It also includes our legal system, which is now forced to deal with major disruptions and also new laws to protect people from the fallout over the coronavirus. Now, just last week, the Justice Department told federal courts that people who intentionally expose others should be prosecuted using federal terrorism statutes. And we're already seeing cases of people facing just those charges. A New Jersey man, he's looking at charges after he allegedly coughed on a supermarket cashier, then said he had the coronavirus. And a Brooklyn man, under arrest, after the FBI said he coughed on them after claiming he too was infected. Should be noted, the feds were investigating them in the first place for hoarding medical supplies so they could sell them at an obscene markup. Plus, we also have the case of two pastors, one in Louisiana, the other in Florida, who are facing charges after they held services in defiance of public health orders. Then there's all the misinformation being spread about the virus, including denial of its very severity. Now, Fox is hardly the only media outlet that allegedly has done this, but it certainly is the most prominent. And now, Vanity Fair's Gabe Sherman is saying that within the network, there's real concerns that they could be possibly looking at legal exposure. What I've been talking to Fox Insiders over the last few days, there's a real concern inside the network that their early downplaying of the coronavirus actually exposes Fox News to potential legal um, action by viewers who maybe were misled and, and actually have died from this. There are a host of other legal issues surrounding quarantines and those who has the ultimate authority, whether it's Washington or local governments. So a whole lot to unpack here. Let's do that with our guest, former federal prosecutor, good friend to the program, Barrett Berger. Barrett is now director of the Center for Advancement of Public Integrity at Columbia Law School. So Barrett, before we even get to, um, you know, who could be in trouble here for whether it be creating circumstances that people were maybe exposed to this virus, who decides um, what the rules are, because state by state, we see different enforcements in, about stay at home, about what people are told they should or shouldn't be able to do. The states seem to have the call here, but if the federal government wanted to, could there be a one size fits all or not? Uh, so the short answer is this really is an issue where the states will ultimately have the power. I mean, this really does bring up issues of both federalism and separation of power, but issues such as public health and the decision whether to issue quarantines or lockdown orders, uh, historically those have been in the domain of the states. So I think that will remain an issue for each state to decide. Now, the federal government can certainly impose its own um, restrictions. The federal government can say, we want to have these, you know, national travel bans. We think this is the time that, you know, uh, civil society should be shut down. But if push came to shove, I think they would be, it would be hard pressed for the federal government, at least right now, to override a state. Uh, for example, if a state wanted to extend restrictions beyond what the federal government was suggesting, I think ultimately the states would win out here. And we've seen even some of these questions playing out in real time. Rhode Island trying to not allow people from New York in the state and all the rest that have been tempered, at least for the moment. But I get this question a lot, uh, Barrett, which is, in Florida, um, and I'll speak for myself, but I think I speak for many, the governor has been hugely irresponsible in allowing spring breakers, most notably, but others to congregate in large numbers. And then they'll go back to wherever their hometowns are. If, let's say, one of those spring breakers that were permitted to engage in highly risky behavior infected someone else, even a senior, and God forbid it cost that person their life, does the family of the senior say, you know, I hold liable here the environment that they were unwittingly put in because they didn't make a choice to act irresponsibly. A governor from another place permitted this, and they brought that virus with them, infecting and possibly even killing my loved one. Yeah, I mean, you can understand why, A, people would be angry and feel that the court system would be sort of the way that they could address this and to try to hold accountable the people that were making poor decisions and, and possibly putting out misinformation uh, to the public. You can actually uh, completely see the grounds for one of these suits. I do think that they may have a difficult time 
ultimately uh, proving successful in these type of suits. How about uh, Liberty University um, or those two pastors that I mentioned, Louisiana and Florida respectively, who encourage gatherings of people uh, disregarding, in some cases, a guidance from the states not to have that permissible, but knowing full well about the possible risks and saying, heck, with it, it's, you know, our location, we're going to encourage people to attend. How much is on the person deciding to go versus the people that are hosting the environment, which we now know has definitively led to infections? Yeah, look, I think there's responsibility on both parties. Certainly, uh, no one's holding a gun to anyone's head saying you must go to religious services or a return to school. Uh, however, the people that choose to disregard state rules, that choose to disregard that guidance, they do bear responsibility. I think that there could very easily be, whether I'm not sure if it would be um, criminal action or, or maybe just some civil action, but for, for encouraging people to take uh, really risky behavior, especially knowing what we know now. And that's really the difference. I think people who acted even weeks ago may be in a much different situation than people that are making these decisions now because of the facts we have. Part of all of these legal actions that we've been talking about is you have to actually um, know that what you're putting out or know that the, the um, situation that you're creating is unsafe. Someone would be very hard pressed right now to make any sort of a, a defense that they didn't know that the situation they were encouraging was unsafe. So I think times really have changed in even just a few weeks and will really continue to uh, in the next month. I mentioned off the top that the deputy AG right now is saying uh, we can prosecute people federally for, under terrorist guidelines here if they knowingly expose people. Um, you know, and there were some egregious examples, people intentionally coughing on people and then right away announcing to them, I just gave you COVID. But what if it's a little bit more nuanced than that? What if you know you've tested positive and still decide to get on the subway or still decide to go into a large group and not notify anyone? We kind of ran into this societally um, at the apex of the HIV era. Um, where does the law start and stop, Barrett, even if they're not intentionally doing it, but knowingly uh, go out into an environment knowing they're already infected? Yeah, I mean, I think this is a really interesting question of sort of the reach of, in this case, the, the terrorism statutes, both on the federal side, but also on the state side. Most states have uh, their own set of, of anti-terrorism provisions. I mean, here, what the uh, deputy AG put out, uh, one of the, the statutes that he was encouraging federal prosecutors to look at was the statute prohibiting the use of weapons of mass destruction. Uh, that statute has a provision that would make it a crime to use any sort of a biological agent, including a virus. So I think this memo really makes clear the seriousness of the problem, um, the extent that the federal government is going to be taking it seriously. And I mean, I think there's a few questions. One, do the terrorism statutes actually reach this kind of conduct? Which I think it's, it's arguable that they do. We've seen um, both the federal government and states bring actions under terrorist statutes for things such as knowingly spreading HIV. We saw this in some of the anthrax cases. So I, I think they probably do extend this far. The second question is, is it, you know, more of a normative question, is this a good idea for the federal government to be um, prosecuting people, whether it's for intentionally doing it or, or the hypothetical that you were raising, just recklessly uh, getting on a subway or something after being, um, after testing positive, you know, is this a good idea? Um, you know, whether or not, and I think it's important for people to remember, whether or not we are applying sort of a novel use of, of terrorism statutes or just more standard criminal statutes like assault or disturbing the peace. I think people need to be very clear that if they knowingly having been infected are going into public places or taking action that could expose others, there are a lot of serious criminal statutes with very severe penalties that could likely attach to what they're doing. All right. Barrett, stay with me, um, because when we come back from the break, Barrett and I are going to discuss how this pandemic is grinding the scales of justice to a halt. Forget about, you know, as it relates to, you know, which cases uh, with COVID. I'm talking generally just about our entire judicial system here. We're going to get into that conversation after this.